Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is, I think, my 91st consecutive weekly economic outlook. Well, where to start? Um, well, I usually try to issue British parochialism, but it's awfully hard to ignore the implosion of our blonde-haired prime minister. After all, only a few years ago, he was a magician capable of reaching parts of the UK electorate that the Tory party hadn't been able to reach in almost 100 years. Now, he's a joke, a bad joke, a buffoon, and an awful lot of far worse things than that, if you believe the media. Part of this is obviously envy, because he was able to slip through every loophole for years. His critics now feel that they have to go over the top. Uh, part of it is that he was roundly disliked by his journalistic peers when he was a hack, partly for his capacity to embellish and even to fabricate stories, and partly because he was so successful at it. But there's obviously more to it than that, presumably. Um, unless you were a total saint. All of us cheated a bit during the various lockdowns. I'm sure we all did, perhaps not as much as Mr. Horta Osario, but if I'd have been offered Wimbledon tickets, maybe I'd have tried it on. But, but we didn't make the rules, and there is something distasteful about the uh, Downing Street children running amok in the garden with their Prosecco parties and their palpable air of unearned entitlement. It, it isn't as if they were the best and the brightest either. It rather seems as though Boris and Carrie brought with them a load of nice but dim types that I thought we dumped years ago along with Harry Enfield. But will Boris be dumped as well? Obviously, uh, I note that even the Financial Times is now calling for his head, calling for him to quit. But then I also note that the FT has drifted so far away from its core readership that I seriously wonder whether the newish editorial team believes in capitalism at all. Boris Johnson's best bet, assuming that dumping carry is out of the question, at least for the moment, is, I think, to rely on all those who are jostling to succeed him, stabbing each other to death. God forbid that we should end up with a Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak double bill, though I guess that's the most likely outcome if Bojo does drink the hemlock, and that probably is the best reason that they won't push him over the edge. In the meantime, however, I, I note that he's planning to, to punish, punish is a strong word, but to punish the BBC by freezing the license fee for two whole years and then uh, for, by abolishing it, uh, and to pour more money, still more money into skills training, whatever that means. That's Operation Save Big Dog, a name that I think sums up just how trivial, juvenile, and asinine UK politics has become. More serious, the main economic focus last week was, as continues to be, inflation. Uh, no surprise, since inflation is now the number one economic issue on both sides of the Atlantic. Indeed, last Wednesday was Inflation Day in the United States, the day the markets stopped much as they used to stop, uh, for the payrolls data on the first Friday of each month. The fear was that the recent rise in prices, which had seen the US CPI hit a 30-year high of 6.8%, would continue, and it did, pushing inflation up to 7% last month. In addition, it was reported that the US PPI, the producer price index, was up 9.7% in December. Well, that was down from 9.8% year on year in November, but the core PPI rose from 7.9% uh, to 8.3%. That makes it certain that the Fed is going to tighten and almost certain that it's going to tighten faster, further, and earlier than it was hinting only a couple of months ago. Last week, uh, senior Fed officials from Jay Powell and Lyle Brainard, right down to regional Fed presidents and Fed, Fed board members were queuing up to uh, outbid each other in their willingness to do whatever it takes to slay the inflation dragon. The next FOMC meeting is on January the 25th and 26th. 
Until now, I think it had been widely expected that the Fed would leave policy unchanged at that meeting and that it wouldn't tighten policy until March. Now, I figure there's at least a 50-50 chance of a 25 basis point increase in interest rates this month and another three or perhaps even four quarter point interest uh, increases during the rest of the year. Other central banks will have no choice but to follow and perhaps to be even more aggressive, not least because we are also experiencing another surge in commodity prices. Last week, Bloomberg's commodity price index was up 2.5%, which is a lot for one week. Nickel is now at a 10-year high. Copper is following. Oil and uranium are up. And the price of lumber is soaring in the United States, where it's a crucial element in home home building. Uh, The situation in Kazakhstan um, doesn't help, nor does the uncertainty over Iran. And indeed, Russia's adventures in the Ukraine and now in the Baltic region are also contributing to this. But what else did we learn about the global economy last week? Well, in the US, the message, I think, was mixed. On the positive side, The budget deficit shrank significantly in December because of an unexpected upsurge in tax receipts. Uh, The national, the NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, Business Optimism Index, which looks primarily at smaller companies, also improved in December. And the Fed's Beige Book Survey of Economic Conditions found that consumer demand and labor markets were both very tight. On top of that, The initial jobless claims figure still is very low. In the latest week, it came in at 230,000. That's up slightly week on week, but very low by historic standards. On the other hand, however, it was also reported last week that retail sales were down. Retail sales, very important statistic, were down 1.9% in December, which was deeply disappointing, though they were still up. I guess, 17% year on year. It was also reported that industrial production fell slightly, 0.1% in December, the first drop since September, and that the flash estimate of the Michigan Confidence Index, which the market looks at, was also down. On balance, I would say not a great week. Uh, Indeed, I note that the latest forecast by... uh, of Wall Street Economist by the Wall Street Journal has them cutting their forecast now for growth in the first quarter of 2022 from a 4.2% annual rate to a 3% annual rate, and for 2022 as a whole to just 3.3% down from 5.2% last year. That's not good. But I also don't think that it'll be enough to shift the Fed's focus from inflation. A sharp increase in the in U.S. interest rates and a tightening of monetary policy more generally are, I think, now baked in. But what about Europe? Well, last week was a pretty thin one for economic releases at the eurozone level. However, it was reported that the eurozone un- unemployment rate was unchanged in November at seven point two percent, which. In, my mind is certainly very high, even by continental European standards. And it was also reported that the industrial production figure was up 1.5%. So to make of that what you will, at a member state level, there was a bit more information on inflation. In France, for instance, the harmonized inflation figure was unchanged in December at 3.4%. But in Spain, it rose. It rose from 5.5% to 6.6%. And in Germany, it was reported that wholesale prices were up 16.1% year on year in December. That will feed through to consumer prices. As for here in the UK, well, Boris Johnson did get some good news last week. In particular, it was reported that GDP, UK GDP, was up 0.9% in November, or 8% year on year, which was significantly better than expected. And it was also reported that industrial production was up 1% in November, though it was up just 0.1% year on year, so not quite as good as it sounded. 
Unfortunately, the broader, the better economic news on growth probably won't help Boris that much. More important, I guess, will be what Sue Gray has to say and how the media spins it. Elsewhere, it was a mixed week for the Japanese economy. On the positive side, the index of leading economic indicators in Japan jumped quite sharply from 101.5 to 103 in November, while machine tool orders, which are also important in Japan, were up 41% year on year last month. On the other hand, however, the EcoWatchers survey, which is uh, closely watched, uh, its outlook index fell from 53.4 to 49.4, and that's I think, important. Uh, there's also, I think, a big issue of inflation in Japan, or rather of deflation. Well, everywhere else is worrying about uh, how fast prices are rising. The Japanese have a different problem. It was reported in Japan last week that the producer price index fell 0.2% in December, though admittedly it was up 8.5% year on year. So even they are not entirely immune. But for the moment, at least, inflation is still not a problem for Prime Minister Kishida. Nor is it a big issue in China, where it was reported last week that the CPI, the consumer price index, fell in December from 2.3% to just 1.5%. Uh, while the PPI, the producer price index, eased from 12.9% to 10.3%. I still think that's very high. However, that was pretty much the extent of the good news for Xi Jinping, at least as far as the economy is concerned. Um, indeed, it was reported last night that Chinese GDP was up just 4.0% year on year, 4% year on year in the final quarter of 2021, down from 4.8% in the third quarter. That was the slowest growth in 18 months. And it prompted the People's Bank of China to cut its key interest rates by 10 basis points, which is, I guess, a symbolic gesture, if nothing more than that. Actually, the number was probably not quite as bad. The growth number was probably not quite as bad as, uh, as the spin that's been put on it. First of all, quarter on quarter growth in the fourth quarter was 1.6%, which was actually better than the 0.7% growth in the third quarter. And second, full year growth for GDP in China last year was 8.1%, apparently. Uh, which was significantly higher than the formal target that the government sets, which was 6%. You can believe these figures if you like, or you can be as sceptical as I am on it. Still, the fact is that most of last year's growth was front-loaded, and there are plenty of reasons for the communist leadership to be concerned. Not least, two big issues. First of all, uh, the extent to which the broader Chinese economy is now vulnerable to the commercial property sector and what's going on there, where the focus last week shifted from the Evergrande uh, implosion, which is continuing, to the Shimao Group, which is a much broader-based uh, industrial and property company. And second, whether or not the government can, can continue its zero COVID strategy, that is locking down any uh, locking down any city, any region where there's evidence of a surge in COVID cases. Uh, I think the plan is to keep that policy in place at least through the Winter Olympics, which will take place next month. But whether it can go any longer than that, I don't know. There are certainly already lots of signs of strain in a, at Chinese ports, and the evidence is mounting that supply chains are being hit again as a result of local lockdowns. Still, for the moment, I guess zero COVID is official policy, and it is being carried out with some severity. That's not particularly good news for global markets. Last week was, I think, pretty tough as far as US equities in particular were concerned with the Dow down another just under 1%, the S&P 500 off 0.4%, uh, and the tech-heavy NASDAQ composite down 0.3%. That was the second week of losses in a row. 
Uh, over here, the uh, Zetrodax and the Cat 40 in Paris were also down, but our own FTSE 100 bucked the trend and closed up 0.8% last week, buoyed, I guess, by rumour and counter-rumour about M&A activity in the UK market. More interesting, perhaps, is activity in global bond markets, uh, though there was a sense last week that the sensible thing was uh, to well, buy the rumour, sell the news, or vice versa. I can never remember which way around it is. The point is that when, while one might have expected the increasingly hawkish voices coming out of central banks to have had a big negative impact on bond prices, in fact, the yield on the benchmark 10-year US Treasury fell last week from 177 to a low of 172 before backing up on Friday to 179. Uh, same in Europe, where the 10-year German Bund yield fell, uh, eased, fell from minus 0.4% to minus 0.7 before backing up slightly to minus 0.5%. As for here in the UK, the gilt yield fell from 118 to 112 before closing on Friday at 1.15%. Odd, in my opinion, that there wasn't a bigger reaction, but I guess markets had already priced in the central bank's policy shift. What of politics? Well, I won't belabor Boris Johnson's problems, but it's certainly worth pointing out that in the US, President Biden is having his own set of problems with his approval-disapproval rating now down to a dismal 35-64, and only 30% of the electorate apparently approving of the administration's, quote, direction of travel. This is a big problem for the White House, which has to decide whether to double down to keep the left wing of the Democratic Party in line or to reach out to moderates in the Republican Party and in the uncommitted center. Um, on this, on one score, um, his spending plans, particularly his Build Back Better bill, Biden seems willing to let Republicans nibble away at the package. On the other hand, he also made an impassioned plea last week for passage of his embattled voting reform bill, which is anathema to most Republicans who see the expansion of absentee and mail-in balloting as an invitation to fraud on a massive scale. Uh, and he offered three key new appointments in the financial field last week that appear to be aimed entirely at placating the left wing of his party. The most important of these is the nomination of Sarah Bloom Raskin, a former Treasury Deputy Secretary and Fed Governor, to the, who's been long been critical of the banks, to succeed Randy Qualls as a Fed Vice Chair for Banking Supervision. The other two were Lisa Cook and Philip Jefferson, two academic economists of colour uh, to be Fed governors. Both specialise in the economics of poverty, and they bring, as the Wall Street Journal pointed out, an unparalleled degree of ethnic diversity to the Fed itself. The question is whether that will be enough to keep the left wing of the Democratic Party quiet so that it won't sabotage the party's midterm election campaign, which, as I've said before, at the moment looks like its only hope of averting a Republican sweep in November is to keep the media's attention firmly fixed on the Trump family's alleged malfeasance. Well, we'll see. For once, I haven't really mentioned geopolitics, but you, you really can't avoid it at the present time. A couple of weeks ago, I was convinced that the most urgent geopolitical issue was Iran and the strong possibility that Israel might launch a preemptive uh, attack on its nuclear facilities. Well, I think that threat is still there, but the focus has now shifted back to Russia and to its confrontation with the United States and with NATO over Ukraine. Uh, which it extended over the weekend to a confrontation 
over the Baltics by ramping up military exercises close to the, the Nordic's borders. I don't pretend to know what Putin is up to, but I only know, and I do know, that uh, Russia's economy is roughly the same size as that of Spain, and that bigging up the threat of a new Russian empire is kind of stupid. That said, hawks in Washington seem to want a showdown, as do lobbyists for Ukraine and, to my disappointment, lobbyists for Poland, and they may get it. Finally, you may have noticed that last that this week, this week, the World Economic Forum is holding its second consecutive virtual Davos. Or you may not have noticed it since the media has been, uh, on the whole, a lot less susceptible to Dr. Schwab's blandishments this year without those magic lanyards that permit uh, journalists to mingle with the rich and famous on the Davos ski slope. Still, the forum keeps on punting, and last week it published its annual Global Risks Report. I have to say that I found it very hard to work my way through this, and it may uh, made a lot more sense in Schweizerdeutsch. But as far as I could work out, the top 10 risks are in order, and, and notwithstanding a good deal of overlap. First of all, climate action failure, which I assume means a failure by governments to live up to the commitments they have made at the top of the risks. Uh, extreme weather events, though whether the latest volcanic activity in the Pacific counts, I don't know. Biodiversity loss, true, I mean, I, important, but hardly likely to produce an imminent catastrophe. Social cohesion erosion. Gosh, I thought, they finally noticed, though the Davos crowd is a large part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Infection disasters, yep, another pandemic. Environmental damage, obviously. National resource crises, debt crises, that was only number nine. I would put it quite a lot higher. And geoeconomic confrontation, which I guess is code for a blow up with China. I really don't understand the appeal of Davos. The banal level of analysis is sort of dispiriting, but it has worked for 40 years and it may go on for another 40. In the meantime, however, today is, today Monday, is Martin Luther King Day in the United States. But that won't, I suggest, distract the market's attention from the issue of inflation or from some of the other key releases due this week, which include in the United States, the Empire State and Philadelphia Fed surveys of manufacturing activity, which are always important. In the Eurozone, the ZEW survey. And here in the UK, the Employment Data and GFK Consumer Confidence Index, both, I think, for December. Uh, they'll all be worth watching, and I hope to see you again next week. Many thanks.